But now, since we're on this subject, and since I know that some people in the audience who are listening to me are technical folks, I want to say one other thing just for the technical folks, and I'll be very brief. I want to tell them how to build an extremely sensitive scalar wave detector. The way you do that is you use the very strongest magnet that can be made. You use a superconducting magnet. Make yourself a field that's 30 or 40,000 gauss. Understand a strong magnet is about 12,000 gauss, a very strong one. And I'm talking about making an extremely strong field. In that pole or in that field, you have a warp in space-time. And it's strong enough that a scalar wave, if you look at that as a longitudinal vector, to the space-time background, it appears to have a lateral component. What that all means is if you stick a normal wire in there and hook it up to a resonant circuit with an oscilloscope, you can detect the scalar wave as an ordinary Maxwellian electromagnetic wave. So you just put it in an extremely strong magnetic field, as strong one as you can make in the laboratory, stick a straight wire in there or a coil or any other kind of detector you want to stick, an ordinary detector, leave one end of it hanging open, tie the other end to a resonant circuit that feeds an oscilloscope, and you can look at all the scalar waves you want to see. So when you do that, you'll find that something like the woodpecker is very much more complicated than what you can find with a normal spectrum analyzer or with our normal detectors. In other words, they can put stuff down below the ocean in the common language I'm using here now, the stuff that our normal detectors don't see. They can put currents, they can put resonant signals, they can put patterns and multiple patterns. The interesting thing about those kind of patterns that you put in, in that way that we do not see with our normal detectors and we don't know are there, in the human body, there are highly nonlinear detectors that are very precise. Uh, up until about three or four years ago, the orthodox scientific view was that the only thing that electromagnetic waves really did to tissue was when they were strong enough to heat it. And if they heated the tissue and hurt it, then that was what damage they did. Simply how much energy was deposited in a cubic centimeter of flesh or something like that was the way they looked at it. Energy deposition. Today, through some very forward-looking scientists who pounded away and done the experiments until they found it and proved it, and it's now been accepted, we now know that a biological system has very, very sharp trigger frequencies in it. And uh, as well pointed out, lo, these many years ago by my good friend Dr. Robert Beck out there in California, I think he's been fully vindicated in the fact that those triggers do exist and they are very precise. The literature now bears out everything Bob was saying quite some time ago. Well, I'd hope he'd get on the air with us, but he he's still shy. Okay, well, that's fine. I understand why. He's got good reason. Uh, but he's a capital fellow, and he, like I say, a lot of the things that he's been doing years ago, and that uh, a lot of people put a lot of pressure on him because he was doing that, uh, he's being fully vindicated at the present time. Now, the scalar wave, if there's a nonlinear part of the body that has one of those sharp biological triggers, let's say down in a cell, and it's quite nonlinear in there. When in the scalar wave part of it, that is, that's below the ocean, the hidden part, if you have that exact frequency in there, and that's absorbed in the body, and you hit that sharp trigger, you get an effect far beyond the very minuscule amount of energy you might be putting into the body. And so if you know about those biological triggers, and you know how to hit them, you can hit them from Riga and Gomel or wherever else you're putting the transmission of this kind of energy out. You can hit them in a U.S. target population. You can hit them in us, sitting here in North America. Are you saying then with transmitters in the Soviet Union, they're able then to affect the bioenergetics of the human body? That is correct, and halfway around the world. I'm saying exactly that. And the scalar component of it, the normal... Uh, you know, conducting shield, a normal, a normal Faraday shield will not work. It won't even slow the scalar wave down because the free electrons don't react to the scalar wave. It goes right through them. It will only react to something that's nonlinear. Uh, you have to build a very nonlinear device to shield against that. You can shield against it, but you can't shield against it the way we normally do shielding. Mm -hmm. And so the normal kinds of shields that we have don't even slow it down. It goes directly on into the body and hits its target if they, in fact, put that frequency in there. And so that sort of thing can be done to the 
population or the target population over in, and you can do it real easy in the zone where you interfere the waves and you make them into normal energy waves there. You can add a component which will hit the weaker biological triggers that way. You just hit it with normal energy. Now the interesting thing about this interference pattern, when you do the interference, the energy which rises that we're forming in the middle rises from the microscopic region. That is, it rises from points in space. It does not come through the space like you would think of a wave going through water. It's as if it arose at each point in the water. So anything in that region has electromagnetic energy forming in it at the smallest point in the atoms, in the nuclei, in the, if it's made of molecules, the material is, it's in the molecules. And so you can have very, very intense point heating occur, a point deposition of energy in an object this way. With that effect, for example, uh, with transmitters in the laboratory putting out to even kilowatts of power, very well focused down into those micro points, you can shatter, for example, giant steel bolts mm. or do things like that because you can get severe deposition of energy in very small volumes of material throughout a uh, narrow section of material. And that becomes a very lethal thing when you do that. And so you can get very localized heating. By the way, psychokinesis, when the human being is able to bend or break metal, mm -hmm. uh, the, it's done exactly by the same mechanism. The two cerebral hemispheres of the brain can act as scalar projectors, and they can produce uh, rays or beams or waves which interfere in a local region. And if you're holding a stainless steel bar, a stainless steel uh, fork, and you get one of these bends or breaks in there, uh, that's the way it's being done. And by the way, I have a friend who I don't think wants his name mentioned, so I won't mention him. But uh, I have a friend who's doing some very excellent scientific work in that area. What he's doing is he'll use something like a stainless steel rod. He'll buy two of them. And he'll take to a place where the, uh, a person does psychokinetic bending. And he will have one of the rods bent psychokinetically. The other will be retained as a control sample. They will then take both of these samples back to the laboratory and section them. And he will look at the cross-sections of both of them under the electron microscope. The interesting thing is the normal control rod, you see the grain pattern just like you would see in a normal piece of metal. But in the, in the rod which has been bent or broken, if you will look at that on the electron microscope, you will see uh, the grain structure has been drastically changed at the microscopic level. It looks like you're looking at the surface of the moon. You see intense heating in little puddles and little holes, just like you were looking at the pockmarked surface of the moon. A completely abnormal thing. And by the way, that's the thing you can't fake on your belt buckle either. No, it's you there. Cannot, you cannot change the grain structure of the metal in that fashion by any sleight of hand trick. And some of the people that are doing these are little old ladies in tennis shoes. In fact, they make the best benders. They really do. And we have one, uh, Greta Woodrue. I think you know Greta. Yes. She shrinks the metal. Yes, indeed. You have other physical effects that let you know that uh, it's not done on the belt buckle or by sleight of hand. By the way, in about two weeks, I'm going to go down and learn how to walk on coals. And I suppose I'm using that left and right hemisphere to do that. Yes, indeed. Uh, since we're on that subject and since we're talk talking about scalar interferometry, we may as well cover the mechanism by which that's done. What happens here, I'll have to cover one other effect of this. In that interference pattern, if it were perfect, if you were making perfect scalar waves, in that interference pattern, the energy that's in there would be totally trapped. In other words, a photon could not be radiated out of there. It would be locked as if it were in a bottle. And I've been calling that an energy bottle. Now, <clears throat> in the real world, you don't make a perfect one. So some of the energy escapes and radiates away as photons. as electromagnetic energy radiating away. But if you have a pretty good bottle, anything that comes in in that bottle, uh, in, the, in its range or in its frequency range, or even close, is going to get locked up in there and isn't going to get out. And so you can do a very amazing thing with that. For example, you can place that kind of a bottle uh, on an object, say like a steel object, and you can be putting in the power now from a distance. Understand, this would be in the laboratory. 
You would have two beams coming in here, which are crossed where the object is. The energy which you're putting in on the other end of the beams is appearing in the bottle, and so you would have a metal object in here. He's white hot. It would be glowing. Because it's not a perfect bottle, you'd be able to see it. You'd be able to take a radiometer and actually measure the temperature to prove how hot it is. You'd have a white hot bottle, <coughs> white hot metal in that bottle. Now, if you turn the power off on the other end smoothly, then the energy in the bottle, you are creating the energy of the distance. That energy will just simply die right down. And you can turn it off and reach in instantly and pick up an absolutely black object that is not hot at all. It's absolutely cold. Hmm. <clears throat> so you can just sort of suck all the energy right out of there. Or you can annihilate the energy is another way to, to, uh, to look at it. That has been done. Uh, <clears throat> and that, of course, can be quite useful. Now, used as a trap, if you have an energy bottle that's placed, let's say, under the bottom of the feet under the soles of the feet or around the skin of the feet. If you have such a bottle <coughs> in the human body and that bottle is correctly made so that heat energy, which is electromagnetic energy, entering it gets trapped, then that foot can walk over hot coals and not be burned. And that is exactly the way fire walking is done. Fire walking is demonstrated widely throughout the earth. Uh, many cultures, many people do it, and as you were pointing out, some of the people here in the United States have now taken up showing that you can do fire walking. Well, there's a group here in Santa Monica that does it. <laughs> about 80% of the people that go through about a four-and-a-half-hour course, which is a mind-quietening technique more than anything else, not only walk on them, they pick them up in their hands. That's true, and you'll see them holding them for several seconds, and you'll see the coal glowing red-hot, and if you look at the temperature of the coal and you're looking at it in the hand, you, and the light and frost effect can only be pressed so far, you realize that you couldn't possibly be looking at that. And I, I'd make your prediction, this effect will grow, and you're going to find more and more people learning to do it. I, on I'm taking a number of firemen. For your handling fire, I recommend great care, and I don't recommend anybody trying it by themselves at all. Well, I'm taking a number of firemen down there. If there's anybody that needs to learn how to handle fire, I think it would be the firemen. Yes. But it, it is a real phenomenon. It can be demonstrated, and uh, I think you'll see it being demonstrated from now on just uh, so that you know people will become aware of the fact that this phenomenon is real. Well, I just got back a couple of weeks ago from Fiji, and I videotaped them walking on those hot coals, uh, hot, hot rocks they were, and they were so hot that they would uh, almost instantly ignite a fresh palm leaf whenever you threw them down on them. Yes, the... Uh... The phenomenon is very impressive. Now, you know, given an energy bottle created by the two cerebral halves acting as a scalar uh, projector, scalar interferometer in a transmitter mode, uh, the human being has the capability of doing that. Now, to understand what we're talking about is a human being has the capability to be a beautiful high wire walker and do all the fancy tricks on the high wire. Now, one normally does not develop that ability. That does not mean it's a fake. We sing. Tom, uh, the music means we're going to take a break. I don't believe this first hour has gone. Uh, the callers are lining up with some very, very incredible questions for you. Let's take a break for the 11 o'clock news. Okay. And we'll be right back right after. Or, Tom, you want to talk to them, and we'll talk about free energy a little bit later, okay? Okay, fine. All right, let me give the numbers for those who do want to get in and talk to Tom, because at, particularly I'm interested in you calling in. If you've seen these strange weather patterns that Tom has talked about, the two-thirds of a circle formed in the sky with uh, about five miles in diameter with long, thin clouds uh, extending out uh, in a radius from it, like a, a radio formation. If you've seen those around the Los Angeles area, we would like to hear from you. The numbers in Los Angeles... Starter, I just wanted to say, when you were mentioning about the walking on fire, yeah. that uh, you didn't say, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, don't do that at home. Okay. Yeah. That's um, very important. Very important. Because it takes a lot of uh, mind uh, exercising and attitude straightening and a lot of things to get that done. Yeah, and that, that sounded very interesting. Um, this really isn't a question. It's more or less a, a statement. You know, you were talking about you, you were interested in uh, people that uh, might have seen those formations in the sky. Yeah. I bet you a lot of people have seen those, but they more or less just passed them by as like uh, jet, uh, jet streams. 
or a, you know, jet exhaust. Would that be possible to mistake them for something like that, or a formation jet exhaust? Well, what you'll find is um, people see it and they say, gee, what an unusual cloud. Right. Uh, and, and they don't think that much about it because we don't normally go around looking at the clouds and trying to compare this cloud with that cloud to find out what types of cloud are in the sky, you know, what the normal types of clouds are. And so we, we have other things on our mind, and after a while it just fades away. We remember we saw an unusual cloud, and that's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really amazed uh, by what you're saying. As a matter of fact, it's the first time I've heard about this. Uh, my next question was uh, the documentation to substantiate uh, your, your claim. I, I've never seen it, or at least I've never heard, uh, you know, Dr. George giving the weather saying we might have scattered uh, rain from the Russians or anything. It, um, now, you, you were saying that you're going to be a... a, a de- making a paper or whatever it may be. How how much of the public on a percentage do you think actually knows about this? Well, I, I'm sure I don't know on a percentage basis. I can tell you what I'm trying to do. Okay. I'm trying to make it as public as possible. Uh, at John Ratzlaff at the Tesla Book Company, and, and Bill will give you the address, I'm sure. Sure. Uh, maybe we can give it on the air here. Certainly can. I've yeah. written a series of papers on electromagnetics, and the part four that John publishes, I gave some of the mechanisms about which this stuff occurs. And uh, just at the end, I mentioned the weather engineering. Now, the next paper will be on weather engineering uh, by itself. Mm-hmm. And what I'm trying to do is make the stuff public so that everybody does know about it, and then maybe you will tune in and have your local weatherman make a comment on it. In Tom's previous papers, uh, Dave, you'll find a rather uh, detailed description of the scalar wave, how you can make your own scalar wave transmitter, in fact. And I would recommend that you uh, write John Rodsliff up there at Tesla Book Company. I, uh, you, you have that address at the tip of your fingers. I know it's on Magnolia. Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, Tesla Book Company, 1580 One Magnolia. Five. Right. And that's Millbrae, uh-huh. California, 94030. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I think you're uh, really doing a service to the American people. Uh, more people need to know about this. This isn't something that... Uh, uh, you read in the National Enquirer, you're, uh, you're definitely qualified to do this because, I mean, you can give an example and uh, they don't, uh, your average Midwestern mentality, I wouldn't say uh, besides not caring about it, they just don't know about it. Or unless if you saw it, like if you were watching Family Feud and they were asking a, a question, you know, someone's altering our weather, you know, the person wouldn't go Russian, you know, wouldn't turn around and go, survey set, you know. Right. <laughs> Russians, uh, two people in the audience would probably say that. Well, what happens if you do that? The eyes go to the top of the head, and uh, they want to get on to the next soap opera, and it's sort of a sad commentary where media has led the American mind. Exactly. Well, and, you know, uh, yeah. the Bill Jenkins show is one of the few shows that will allow somebody to mention a subject like that and go into the detail that's necessary for you to understand it. Yeah, I understand that. Most of the people that will call you and ask for a comment on something like this will say, you know, give it to me in, in three minutes flat. And right. that's impossible. You can't do that. Hey, no. I know you got a lot of the callers. I have one more question. You're talking about the Russians doing this as a, as a, as a possible uh, offense or defense, whatever you call it. Can't this be used for uh, countries that have uh, extreme droughts to produce rain to, uh, for their crops? Oh, absolutely. It, uh, the... The fact that they weaponize this has nothing to do with the fact that the scalar technology has a, a marvelous array of things that can be done for the benefit of humankind. Mm-hmm. And what I would like to see is a widespread development of it for the benefit of humankind. In medicine alone, it can do spectacular things. I would suspect, Tom, that the, uh, this research was really generated out of a need to move weather in the Soviet Union uh, into their agricultural areas. They've had a lot of trouble over there. They've had to buy a lot of wheat from the United States, and after they found out they could do it, they found out it was a weapon system and started playing with that, too. Right. That's unfortunate, but it seems like uh, that's what uh, the, the more interest is in, rather than uh, preserving life, uh, uh, destroying it. Uh, one last quote, uh, put a little light on the subject. I was just thinking if the, if the French did it, maybe it uh, might start raining Perrier water. <laughs> but it was nice talking with you, and you're very informative. And I've got your address, and I will be writing in it. I just wanted to say to all the other listeners that they should uh, write in on this and uh, be more to open to uh, uh, human beings like yourself. Well, thank, thank you very much, Dave. Very Pleasure good. Have a good night now. Okay, Dave. Good for you. Randy, you're on. How are you doing? Good evening, Tom and Bill. Yes. Okay. Now, I'm not an engineer, but I'd appreciate it if you'd recap a little bit, um, if you'd follow me while I frame this so that I understand it. Are you saying, in effect, that these transmitters in, in the Soviet Union 
send out currents that cross, in a sense, like an XY graph, and that those points can be plotted anywhere in the country or the world, for that matter? Yes. And at that point, that nodal point, um, these radio clouds form. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Now, what controls, then, the distance in the atmosphere from the ground? How high? These, For example, you said you were flying over 35,000. You could see them below you. What controls that distance? Okay, you've asked me one of the questions. At the present time, I do not know, and I don't uh -huh. mind telling you when you hit something I don't know. All right. I don't know how you control how high it is, how you get it out of the ground or up in the atmosphere and control the altitude. That I do not know. Okay, now, my other question about that. Um, with the incredible amount of general electromagnetic radiation in the atmosphere from everything from, you know, microwave ovens and, you know, ship-to-shore transmissions, everything, TV stations... Wouldn't there be a breakup just from the enormous amount of uh, um, EMR that would cause all these clouds to sort of scatter rather than have a, uh, a coherency to them? Well, uh, from the normal stuff that you get, uh, by the way, there are scalar currents in the Earth, and uh, it's my theory that the normal striations that you get in, in great number in, in large masses of clouds are caused really by interactions between the scalar currents in the Earth and resonance with the cloud. I think the Earth is already doing uh, scalar weather engineering. Naturally formed? Naturally. Or... Naturally. But, uh, I think that these particular signatures and things I'm talking about here are abnormal. They are unnatural. They are man-made. And certainly the adjustment in of the network was picked up and detected here in this country. And, yep. and the fact that these little virtual transmitters exist throughout the country, that fact was picked up and measured by the people who are out there in the field measuring it, and they reacted to that very quickly. Mm -hmm. So uh, certain parts of this thing were detected, mm -hmm. and the rest of it you have to piece together like piecing a jigsaw puzzle together. But if you do know something about the scalar electromagnetics, then it all makes sense. It all adds up, and then you see the signatures in the sky, and you know what you're looking at. Now, does the... What was I going to say? The, the um, system, the government was going to set up the Pentagon that, uh, to transmit across, I don't know, seven states to the oceans to control the submarines? That's Is that a normal similar? ELF type uh, transmission. Yes, we know that normal ELF will, uh, that's extra low frequency, you know, you get the frequency down very low, right. and by very low we might mean 30 hertz, for example, we, you know, somewhere in that region, 60 hertz, 50 hertz, 30 hertz. Uh, if you get down to that region, we know that wave will go through the ocean. Mm -hmm. The normal electromagnetic wave of that frequency will have gone down through the ocean to the sub. Now, the problem you have there is you don't have very much data rate. It takes you forever to send the message of any length to that submarine. And so, uh, you know, what people would like to have would be something up in the megahertz band where you can send the message very quickly. Now, we abandoned that project, as I understand, because uh, different local governments were I don't think we've abandoned the ELF at all. No, we haven't. It's, uh, it's running full tilt. Oh, I thought a number of the states were absolutely opposed to having it run across their lines. Well, uh, certainly that's been true. That's yeah. correct. But uh, the project is still ongoing. I see. Now, what about the U.S. intelligence community? Do they not even look at these, uh, at these items? Or do they, and simply are, are mute about it? Okay, let me, that's a very important point that you raise, and let me address that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The intelligence analyst is, let's say he's an electrical engineer, or he's a physicist, or, you know, a technically trained person, but his training is from the orthodox scientific community. Now, scalar waves and scalar technology does not exist in the normal textbook, nor is it taught at the normal university. Okay, if you have one of these people or a group or an agency that gets interested in this area and says, maybe there's something to it. Now, they're spending taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. The first thing they have to do, they have to turn to the orthodox scientific community. They try to turn to the best people they know. And they say, tell us about scalar electromagnetics so we can train our analysts and so they'll recognize the stuff when they see it. And the orthodox scientific community doesn't have scalar electromagnetics in it, so it says there is no such thing. It is all a bunch of hooey. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. They think you're not in this whole well, theory. Of course. Uh, you know, that's, that's a kind word. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, <laughs> uh, the intelligence analyst then, since he's spending taxpayer money, is certainly not going to go against the expert advice that he, he gets from the scientific community. And by the way, justifiably so. 
I'm on his side in that in that thing, mm. even though it goes against me. Can't blame him. That's right. He does. He would not spend taxpayer money on every will of the wisp that comes along. What I'm trying to do is say that this is not a will of the wisp. This is real. It's there. It can be measured and can be detected if you build the detectors. And I can tell you enough about it so that you can go in the laboratory and start developing the detectors and so that you can actually build some of the effects and see that it's real. And then you take over from there. No, well, that's what I'm what... trying to do. And it has to be attacked in this fashion so that enough of the orthodox scientific community changes. Then we'll have the intelligence analyst change, and all of a sudden intelligence will be full of it. Is the orthodox community looking at this now? I mean, have, uh, do you some have any parts people? of it are mm -hmm. by people who are being very careful that their scientific reputation doesn't get ruined. In other words, they're doing it in secret. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot so. of private citizens that are working on it, Randy, all over the country. Uh, some of them as that are in government, but they don't want to are in academia, but they, <laughs> they don't want to acknowledge it publicly. They don't want to disperse their well. reputation in case it goes wrong. But nevertheless, they're sitting out there and, and beginning to work on it. And uh, mm -hmm. Tom is one of the. One of the men who has uh, enough to him where he can stand out there on the limb and nobody's going to saw it off after him because his, his word is pretty good. I well, the main it. advantage, you know, being very honest, the main advantage I have is that I really don't have any orthodox scientific reputation, nor do I have any that I have to establish or defend. And I'm perfectly willing to live by the laboratory experiment. If the experiment keeps showing that we can have this kind of wave and we can have these kind of effects, then the scientific method says you have to change the theory. Now, if the experiments do not show that, then what I'm saying would be wrong, you see. And I'm perfectly willing to abide by that. That's called the scientific method. That's the way we ought to do it. So you need general support within the scientific community willing to look at these data and willing to at least consider the possibility of changing their whole framework. Yes, one of the problems, you see, <clears throat> is that nobody in the scientific community, no source of funding at the present time that I know of, is going to fund this kind of work. Mm -hmm. The reason that I'm able to do a little bit of this kind of work in my private life is because I'm able to make a decent living at another kind of skill and pay the grocery bill with that. And I'm able to afford to do a little bit of this in my private life. And so I do what I can. <clears throat> if we lot. ever get it being believed, we will have funding sources and we'll have a lot of work done and we'll have a lot of progress real quick. And that's what we've got to get to. We've got to get it into the universities. I'll be following this. If you can just touch on one more thing, I'll let you go. When you talked about the uh, the storms in South California last year that sounded uh, Malibu, tore down the houses, um, people were saying that this is something that happened 200 years ago, I think it was. Uh, a number of meteorologists were speaking about that this is a natural occurrence, and the only thing that's unusual is that we haven't been around in terms of recorded uh, meteorological activity to have that documented, but that actually all of these rains and the... Uh, the way that they actually came in much more onshore than before was a natural occurrence that is, in a sense, cyclical, but over a long period of time. And they explained it that way, at least most of the... I thought uh, it was results. an interesting explanation, being that it never yeah. been recorded before in the past. How <laughs> no. do they know that it happened? Oh, well, not exactly. Now, are you saying that they plotted, in a sense, the Soviets, assumingly, over California, these points, and then these points caused severe buildups of... Uh, go on with it. You, you explain Okay, what I'm saying is they put radiation waves in a beam which has a certain width. Mm -hmm. And by the time that thing gets over North America, it's pretty wide. And so over the United States and Canada, they established multiple beams like this interfering with each other. The interference pattern is that grid I was talking about right, right over North America. Okay. The one that I'm saying that a friend of mine and I saw sitting up in the sky, clear as a bell, right here over Huntsville, Alabama. Now, once they had the grid in and adjusted and got through with all the controls and the phasing and everything, at that point, they had a system set up where they could do weather engineering. Now, that <clears throat> adjustment did occur just about, uh, they finished that thing about towards the end of February or so, or in the middle of February of 1983. And so they had that thing in place in time to influence the weather. Now, understand, <clears throat> they don't completely control the weather. They just influence and divert it. The more power they put in, the more diversion, the more influence they can get. And so that's what I think really happened. It's the degree of the storm you got <clears throat> and the misshapen path of the jet stream that's significant. It's not the fact that, uh, you know, nature never produces a violent storm. Of course it does. 
And I don't think we saw any storms 